Hello, everyone. Welcome to Maker Monday. Um, I know maybe this is not a face you recognize. <laughs> I am your guest host today. My name is Susie Belzer. I am an elementary art teacher here in Fort Atkinson, just down the street from NASCO. Um, if you're joining us, feel free to join in on the chat. Let us know where you're from, what age group you teach. And we are here today to meet Andrea Worthy. Andrea's got an awesome lesson to present to us. So I'm gonna let Andrea introduce herself and talk a little bit about her lesson, but feel free to keep chiming in on the chat and introducing yourselves. Hi, I'm Andrea Worthy. I'm a high school teacher in Menominee, Wisconsin, which is Northwest. So it's towards Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Um, so I started this lesson actually when I was teaching middle school prior to this position. Um, a lot of my students, we had a lot of oil pastels. And if you're like me, um, you probably had a lot of oil pastel crumbs <laughs> and broken oil pastels around. And I tried to think of different things that we could do with it other than doing landscapes. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's a traditional thing that we, I usually show students. So I wanted to see, um, I myself am a mixed media artist. So I wanted to kind of show them how you could do um, some different work um, in just different ways and use different mediums um, to approach something. So um, at the high school level, this was actually in one of my um, my drawing and painting two classes. We talked a lot about how do you depict motion um, in a still work of art, and so we um, we looked at many different artists all through from the Renaissance to contemporary artists and just looking at like how are um, what are different ways or methods that artists use to show something in motion. And so um, we had like seven or eight different ways and um, the students kind of helped. I have a, a PowerPoint. So if anybody wants to, <laughs> wants it, just let me know. Um, but we went through and talked about like, if something's in the air, obviously we're assuming there's gravity. So that means that if it's going up, it must come down. Or we looked at comic books and how do comic books or graphic novels show motion. Um, and so we talked about what are different things that, that are moving if they're on water, how would it look as opposed to if, if it were in the air. Um, so we spent a couple of days on that and then we really dove in um, to playing around with oil pastels and so I'm going to show you folks kind of how I approached it. I'm going to show you some things that worked, some things that didn't work. Um, I always try to show students what I call non-examples so um, it's it's an example of um, what happens if you do something one way instead of the other way. Um, so I'll show you a few of those um, oops moments um, that I think are helpful just for students to visualize. Um, and I kind of have it set up. Um, so I have a bunch of different um, the projects in different stages because it does take a little time to dry. Um, but I will go through kind of that process with you and feel free to throw questions in. And if I don't see them, um, Susie's going to help me uh, shout out questions as I go. Sometimes I kind of get caught up in the moment. So um, I'm glad you're all here. This is super exciting. This is my first time doing this. Um, so I, it's so cool to see people from all over the United States. This is awesome. Um, so give me one second and I'm going to switch cameras here. There we go. And I'm going to turn a little light on here. So um, I started out, um, it looks like they put a link to the lesson plan in there. So I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit. Um, I just used plain paper. I really tested out um, different papers that I had, some that were donated. I tested out tag board. I tested out a bunch of different things. Um, just, I think using what you have on hand, I'm very much, um, someone who likes to stay close to my budget. And we had a bunch of um, paper that was donated, but I actually um, used the NASCO paper is what worked best for me. It is lighter and it can buckle a little bit, but if you tape it down um, and we mounted these in, um, in matting, so it tended not to matter as much, but that's just worked what worked best for us. So um, what we did is we started off talking about, um, let's see, I'll zoom out here, about composition. And so a lot of times I would get students who 
were really stuck on what to do for motion. And so I wanted to just show an example. This is just a super quick sketch of a chameleon. Um, but it's often I'll get a student who has something that they're like, okay, this is it. But I'm like, okay, so how are you going to show motion? And so we talk about like the air around it. And a lot of times I'll use like Van Gogh as an example, or because that's when they can think of usually off the top of their head is Starry Night. And we talk about the motion that's shown there um, through the sky or some of his other paintings. And so we talk about like, how can you show that there's atmosphere and wind? And so once they kind of get there, I have them map it out with pencil first. So that's what I did with this guy. Um, and then I have them, I always say, probably what many of you say is draw light till you get it right. Um, in this case, we're going to be covering everything. So it's not um, the end of the world. And I'm going to draw a little bit darker just so you can see it because it looks pretty light here on the screen. Um, but so we talked about like using swirls and it could be a sense of motion through how how we're using direction. Um, so once you have kind of your idea of what you want to do, the first thing you're going to do is go over it with marker. Um, that sounds kind of funny because we're going to be using oil pastels, but it's really important because this will help show through your lines. It'll make them even blacker when we put um, the temper paint over it. So it's really important that we're using those to really guide us. I usually give my students um, a few different types of pens. Um, as long as they're permanent, they should work. Um, so I usually give them some chisel tips. I'm very much about like choice. <laughs> Would, um, whatever works best for them. Sometimes what works best for me isn't always best for them. Um, and it also kind of depends what I have um, in supply too. But so uh, we talk a lot about line variation. Um, so that's especially when we're kind of going towards um, when we're talking about motion and movement. Sometimes, um, so this is like a double, this is, has the chisel on one end and then it's a pretty, I can get it off here. Um, also, I'll give them just a regular Sharpie. And then one thing that I always bust out are my favorite Micron pens, <laughs> just because you can do a bunch of details um, and it, you have some choice with your, your line too. So if you wanna do thick or thin. Um, so those are for the things that I give them, especially when we're looking at some details. Um, I like to use them just because it's a, it's a little bit easier for me to control. But so this is really just kind of after we talk about motion the first few um, days, um, like I said, this is a, a little bit more advanced class. So we're talking about texture. This is really one of the first things I do because we're also using this to review the elements and principles. Um, so we're using, we're talking about texture, we're talking about um, motion, balance, all of those, all those good things um, that are in a recipe for a, a good piece of artwork. Um, so ideally you would go through and cover everything with marker. So I'm gonna show you this next one. So this is a lot of it's done. Um, I have kind of this bottom part, I'll, I'll show in a second. Um, but so this is after it's all has marker on it, um, I go in with the oil pastel. So I just have a set of these. Um, we found that um, these worked really well. Also um, the Sakura ones work really well. Um, sometimes also I had students that even tried um, Prisma colors since they're um, wax based. So those also work, they just have to apply them really heavy. So I think it's up to you what, um, what you wanna use. But like I said, um, one thing that's nice about this too is that many students haven't used oil pastels maybe since elementary school. So we kind of, um, I give them some sheets and in their sketchbook really encourage them to play around um, and just really experiment. We kind of talk about blending. Um, when we're going in here, the idea is that they don't wanna go over um, the Sharpie marker, um, the permanent marker. You wanna try to go around it as much as you can, just because then your paint's really gonna attach to the paper there and not on your actual oil-based um, or your oil pastel or colored pencil, if that's what you're using. Um, 
So it's important too to get like a lot of layers on there. I'm pushing pretty darn hard. Um, I think it's better to press harder than not, which I mean, within reason, you don't want them breaking all your crayons, right? Um, but you also wanna make sure that you have enough there because you're gonna be scratching some of it away. So this is really laying down your color foundation. Um, one thing you also wanna to note to students is that if they wanna use white, they need to actually color it white. So they can't just use white paper because it won't come through. And I'll show you an example of what that looks like if they do do that um, in a second. So I have some of these feathers down here. Um, I've colored in white. And then again, like you can go in and blend I wouldn't suggest, um, I guess uh, in the past, like I'll use my fingers to blend or like a warm, like a cloth or something like that. I wouldn't smear too much. Um, I would just try to layer your color kind of on top of each other. <clears throat> that seems to work best. And ideally you wanna color your entire sheet. Um, so I have kind of some blues here. And notice I don't have like a ton of lines showing motion here, but I can add more um, as I am actually doing the engraving and scratching away. So a lot of it is kind of, um, of thinking ahead a little bit, or it kind of depends what you want to do with the lesson too. Like if you want to be more kind of in the moment and have them, you know, like decide as they go. Um, I even had my students plan it out because there it was pretty specific what they needed to be doing. Um, but sometimes it's just fun to play around with it too. And I had them also, um, I had some scratch paper um, that they could kind of play around with and make a little example. So they had an opportunity to see what it was like to color and scratch away um, before they started on their final. Um, for some students, that's super important. Um, at least <laughs> the students that I have, um, they, they wanna try it first and feel a little safe before they tackle their, their main drawing. Um, so I'm going over a little bit of the black here. That's not the end of the world, um, just because we'll usually be able to see over the top of it. Because when we put the actual mixture on top, um, it tends to be a little transparent. You can kind of see it here. It's not like a full black black. Um, so that will help when we, I've never had people sit and watch me color before. <laughs> it's therapeutic. It is, it is. Or After a long day of teaching, it's like, I could just watch you color. I love it. So I just kind of add rough, um, like it's really kind of, I think of it like an underpainting almost. I'm just adding color um, to emphasize what I'm going to be doing. So we'll pretend that this is all full of color. Um, what I'll do next is show you. So one thing that's kind of cool about this is you really don't need much tempera paint. Um, I had a gallon and I probably used Oh geez, I don't know, maybe like a cup um, because I also, and I think I have the recipe right there on the lesson. I would test it out. Um, what works for you might be a little bit different. I use Dawn dish soap. Um, for me, I feel like Dawn is, is my go-to, <laughs> um, but if you use a different soap, um, like a school dish soap, I don't know how it will react. Um, I used one once that was like apple scented and that was a terrible, terrible idea apple scented temper paint is not, <laughs> oh my God. I would not suggest for anyone. Um, but so you're just using your black temper paint. I just had a jar um, uh, from home that I recycled because um, I have art teacher hoarder syndrome, like many of us probably do. Um, but you just mix it up with water um, and your soap right in it. And it, this container, like my kids know, like the, and I have it labeled, it's just for this project. Um, so I'm gonna use it. I have, I set it up in uh, little workstations and usually they'll come up with newspaper underneath. Um, 
one thing I tell them too, is they need to make sure that they cover everything. Um, it's also really important that you're using a soft bristle brush, because if you're using something more coarse, you're going to get a lot of like lines in it um, that are going to compete with what you're actually scraping off. So I try to use something um, really soft, like a watercolor brush. This is actually for ceramics. Um, it's a glaze brush, but I think this is just a nice way to um, kind of go. I got to make sure I stirred this up here, my concoction. And then you're just going to paint it on and it always looks darker. This is like the terrifying moment for some students because they're like, oh my God, I just ruined my thing. They didn't ruin it. It actually dries a lot lighter than what you're seeing. Um, so I just do one coat and I kind of go crossways. And sometimes you'll get little bubbles in there and that's not a big deal. It kind I, of, oh, go I ahead. Type, I typed the recipe in the chat. Um, I just looked it up real quick. So two tablespoons dish soap, one cup black tempera paint, one cup water. That's what she's using right now. And like I said, test it out first um, because like if you're, some of my students, I'll, I'll share with you their hacks <laughs> um, of some of them were like, oh my gosh, I want to see more detail and I couldn't see as much. Um, so they, I'll show you what they did with theirs too. Um, but this is just a, it's just one coat. It doesn't take very much. It dries pretty fast. Um, it depends, you know, some of you probably have 90 minute classes. I think mine are like 45, somewhere around there. Um, so I usually have them finish up, do this and let it set on the, um, on the drying rack for the next day. But sometimes I'll have students that will show up and it's done and they need to start going. So I have um, blow dryers or heat guns that they can just hit it with it for a couple minutes. It You can see like parts of it. I know there's kind of a glare, but the parts of it are drying already and it starts to look really matte. So you'll know when it's dry because it will have kind of like a chalky matte um, look to it. Give me one second. So like I said, you would just set this aside and let it dry. And I'm gonna get one of my other ones here. And I usually have them keep it on another piece of paper just because then they're not handling that sheet of paper. It kind of cuts down on the mess. Um, so once it is dry, you will see that it kind of, you can start to see through it more. Um, so this is one that I used for a demo for my class um, and I had it kind of in different stages. And this was also, you'll see, like I was talking about doing paper tests. So like this is a tag board. Um, this one I didn't like as much because it took too much of the uh, oil pastel off. Um, this is the NASCO paper. So you can see that the color is really bright in these. Um, and this was another type of paper that I had that was kind of recycled and it was in kind of the middle, middle range, but it still took a lot of pigment off. And so I felt that um, the NASCO paper itself kept a lot of the pigment. Um, so that's what we, we used. So once it's all dry, um, and again, like I said, I had my students make little squares too, just practice squares that they can kind of goof around with because you are going to use um, what you'd use like an engraving tool or a scratch off tool. Um, you might have used scratch board before. This is very similar to that. You're just kind of creating your own, but it's giving it more of a texture. Um, I'll see if I can give it a little more light here so you can kind of see some of the colors through there. Um, and again, when we're talking about motion, um, I really tell them to think about how, what direction are they using their actual um, engraving tool in. And so I'll show you, like this was one I let them test on because like I said, it wasn't, it didn't turn out the best. Um, so they could kind of goof around with this. Um, and you'll see too, it's a little hard on here, but you can see my marker outlines. Um, Oh, what poundage of paper worked best? I just found the one that I listed in on the NASCO. It was just like plain white paper. And in my head, I was like, oh, tag board will work the best because it's heavier, right? Um, but it seemed that it was just the regular, um, the regular white paper, kind of drawing paper that worked the best. For me, like I said, I you could try a bunch of 
different tests too and see what works best for you. I just found that it had, it kept the pigment the best. Um, so I have them do a test before they, they go on to their big one. Um, especially with these tools, there's a lot of different things you can do. You can buy different tips. Um, I had them, uh, sometimes I feel like when we have so many choices, it's a little overwhelming. Um, so I just gave them one tip and if they were super into it or they wanted to know how to do something else, I let them know that they were there. Um, you can buy like a whole series. I think it's like a set of six, um, and so with this, I just showed them like you can use the side of it to get big spaces. Um, you can also use the tip of it to get really tiny like hairline scratches as well. One thing that I had students do is um, the first thing they wanted to do was sit down and scratch away at a big part of it. And I explained to them like, this is really about not only the motion of the piece itself, but it's also the motion or the intention of the artist and what motion they really want their marks to show. Um, so like, for instance, this one, I kind of just went back and forth to show them like, don't just scratch it off because we do want to see some of that black that's left there. If they do go over the marker part, it just, it just shows the marker outlines. So it's not, it's not the end of the world. Um, and then you kind of have that that's stuck there, but with the edge of the pencil, you can go in and you can really like start to get more form with it. And like I said, looking at like your direction, I think the hardest part I had with students is sometimes we have the early finishers that just wanna like get done. Um, and so I'm gonna move over to this other one cause it's more vivid. Um, so when they just like start scratching off, they can scratch through their paper or if they're scratching too hard, they can also scratch through all of their crayon. So they need to just go light and be really intentional with it. Um, I usually, um, when I'm showing them, I try to show them a variation of, of line um, within my own stuff. And again, I think it kind of looks like a relief print in the end. I explained to them that, you know, if we, we want to see some of the black paint through there and the marks because again it's giving us this motion. Um, so I have like the motion of my lines here. Um, it's not necessarily going with the color pattern in the background, but that doesn't that doesn't bother me any. Um, if you do go over some of your over your paint, um, well, I'm sorry. If you go over some of the marker part, sometimes it will get like a dull color. Um, so you just want to try to avoid it if you can. I'm trying to think if there's a, are there any questions so far? I know I'm probably talking fast and I talk a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's fine. There was a question about what type of engraving tool you used and Abby put the link in. Oh, okay. Great. So I believe like the name brand is Scratch Art and the name of the tool is a Scratch Art tool. Like I think it's, I, I don't think it has a fancy name, but yeah. the, link, the link is in the chat now. And honestly, like I kind of went for, the cheapest one, um, just because I have a lot of students. Um, yeah. And I do a checkout system. So they're all numbered and I have them kind of like in this little display thing. So I know who's checked theirs in and who hasn't. They're really not sharp. So they're not going to cut you. They're pretty dull tools. Um, they're not like printmaking chisels. Um, so it's not like weapon worthy, but I still like to keep track of everything. Um, yeah. It is messy. So you can see my fingertips are already about black. So what I like to do too, is always have the students if I can find here, um, usually have them have a little paper underneath this because you don't want them to blow all the crumbs all over. Um, and one way to just kind of move stuff around is just to use a brush and lightly brush it off. It kind of depends how hard they're pressing. There shouldn't really be a lot of crumbs, um, but this way it kind of contains the mess. And then you don't have the big ploof of, um, of tempera crumbs. You could definitely use a, a bigger brush and because it's tempera, it washes out too. Um, but just so you can note that it is a little bit a little bit messy. Um, so we kind of, I just go and kind of look at different line widths, different pattern. Um, I'm trying to think, I have another one here somewhere. So Andrea, there's a question in the chat about um, the scraping. If, if the scraping is just scraping away the dried paint layer yep. that the oil pastels revealed. 
Yep. So you're just a scraping away that dry layer. So like with this one, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. So hopefully you can kind of see my swirls here. So you can see like where my black marker outlines are. Um, and you're really just lightly, lightly scraping that top layer away. So you can really see, um, especially if you're blending your color, um, you just don't want to scratch too hard. Um, I'll show you an example of one when you scratch too hard. Like I said, I like to give my students a lot of non-examples. <laughs> so like, this is what happens if you do this. So like, here's a great example of one that I showed them like, this is what happens if you just go back and forth. It's pretty stagnant. There's not a lot of motion to it. Also, there's no wax under this part. So if you start to uh, scrape away on here, you see it gets really dull and kind of like an icky black color. Um, so that's why you wanna try to cover everything. Even I've had students, um, and I'll show you some examples of their work that if they wanted a section that was really dark, I really tried to encourage them to think of like a chromatic black, like what happens when you have like blue and purple and black together, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it gives it a little bit more depth. But this is, I think just, I like having this as an example, just so they can see, okay, if I scratch this really fast one way, it's not gonna look really great. And if I don't fill in my spots with um, the oil pastel, it's gonna be kind of this dull, um, scratchy, weird color. And then if they go too much, you can see that it's just gonna be like this, it, you're just taking everything off. So it's white and then it eventually starts to get into the paper itself um, and it'll start to kind of crumble away. So I didn't have too many students do that. I think it was just important to let them know, like I kind of showed them like, you're just lightly going just like you would on the back of your hand, you know, if you were slightly rubbing it. Um, and then they probably got pretty sick of me saying slow and steady wins the race. But um, so this was my non-example. So I could show them or they could even like come up and uh, they thought it was pretty cool that they got to work on my examples <laughs> or ruin them for that matter. Um, have you had any trouble with the black paint mixture not sticking to the oil-based coloring material? No, I haven't actually had that problem. Um, but I, again, the oil, the um the paint not scratching off, that's only when it's not covered. Um, so the reason I leave the marker parts is just because I want it to stick there. Um, but if it, like I said, if there's no oil crayon underneath here, um, it tends to just, it just gets kind of dull colored and it doesn't really do much of anything. Um, can I see where to scrape off where the oil pastel is? So you should be able to. So some of my students had a harder time um, and we're lucky enough to have this really weird light table <laughs> in, my, in one of my rooms, um, which I know not everyone has. Um, I will show you their, their hack here if I can figure out how to turn. Hold on one second. So I had a lot of students that wanted to get really detailed. They were actually super into it. Um, hold on one second. I'm going to see if I can, let's see. Oh, I just did what I didn't want to do. So they just use the flashlight on their phone. Um, so they just did this and then they put it under so they could see where it goes. So I'll do it on this one because there's more black in there. So like they wanted to get super detailed. Like I can see pretty well on here where everything is. Um, but I just have some of those kids that are like really detail oriented. I know that we're allowed to have phones in our school um, for use for good, not evil. <laughs> so I let them take it out to use it if they so choose. Um, but otherwise it has to be a way. So they use that. Um, some kids did just because they really liked it. They wanted more control over it. I had other kids who were like really excited to just like kind of have that surprise factor. Um, when I did it with middle school, we did it a lot darker and we actually used um, black oil pastels instead of permanent markers. So you could see it a little bit better even. Um, but I think it just kind of depends. Um, I mean, you know your students better than anybody. So I think whatever, whatever works best for them. That's a really cool hack. Like, yeah. <laughs> they were like look at this and I was yeah. like oh, that's genius way to go because they can all fit around this big table you know so right. um, and they thought it was perfect too because they're like oh it's like a light table at home so yeah yeah way to make it accessible I love it is there any other questions that I'm missing no I think you got them all right now okay 
So I'll show you some examples of ones that my students have done. Let's see. So, um, and these are some good examples too of, of what, um, like these are all different grade levels, all different, um, all different levels of students, honestly. They're all high school students, um, but some are adaptive ed, some aren't. Um, so like this one shows, like I said, it kind of the typical, um, so, well, this was actually a few different things. They also had to write about it and like tell what kinds of motion. I can't get like the perfect angle. So I'm gonna zoom out again. Um, but so like this was, again, we talked about if something's in the sky, assuming you're in a place with gravity and not a fictitious world, um, if it's up, it will eventually come down. So it means that it's flying and in motion. And then they also showed motion um, through the sky. So like the wind in the sky. Um, this student showed, it was actually um, around Hmong New Year. We have a lot of students who, um, we have a really strong uh, Hmong population here in Menominee. And so they wanted to show traditional dance. And so they showed it by, um, we talked about blurring. And so they wanted to give um, the sense of blurring motion to like show the arms uh, waving through the dance. And I thought that was just a really interesting way of, of kind of putting it together and then also having having the background. Um, one thing too is sometimes, and then skin tones are really hard, um, especially because you have to blend. So I did have students, um, some other students we kind of problem solved um, to make it a little bit darker or just use different colors. Or like I said, we'll go in and use Prisma colors. That one was beautiful. I love the background too. Yeah. So this one is supposed to be like a circus scene. So this we are talking about like movement marks, much like a graphic novel. Um, this one's a little more, a little more trippy. It's supposed to be a candle, and this is like the smoke coming from the candle. Um, so they really like this one. I don't know. I'll try to hold it up here. It's like super detailed. Um, so this is a student that used their phone that was like really into it. <laughs> For some kids were like, I want to get done with this. Um, but I heard a lot that they thought it was very therapeutic and meditative because they're like, it's so relaxing that they could like, they're like, it's, oh, what was that? It's so satisfying. That's what yes, I Yes, they love that word. Yeah, they're like, oh, you put it on and then you just <laughs> scratch it off. So this is another one. So again, looking at like motion of wind, wave, things in the sky. Um, you know, we talked about like, bending of things so like the leaves aren't just straight on some of them are bent or curled um I really let them take it wherever they wanted to so this student is oh. he's a riot and so he had a flaming jet wiener dog helicopter in the sky <laughs> So he used a lot of different, we also talked about like bending or moving in motion um mm -hmm. so they had to really try to utilize different ways to show motion. So he's he's a funny kid. And here's another one. This is a great example of using white. So the white isn't going to be like a pure white. Um, but again, this is a person that used like it's hard to see, but it's like a lot of detail, a lot of line variation, um, and really just kind of thinking about how they wanted uh, how they wanted it to move. So whether it's the octopus legs or we talk about like movement in water, um, movement and things like being more in the distance. Um, so this is one of my sophomores. Oh, wow. And then this is another one. So this is one that um, the, the battle of black, right? Or the battle of space. Cause I always tell kids, I'm like, when you make something really black or really white, I, it tends to flatten stuff out. So we really talked about how can you use a chromatic black? Um, and they were really into space jam. And I was like, <laughs> if you make it your own, you totally go for it. Um, and it's one of our, our basketball players. So I'll hold it up so you can see it a little bit better. So there's even like shading within mm -hmm. like Jordan there. So they're really using like cross hatching and um, their line width and variation to show different parts of it. Um, and like using a lot of different colors. So with, you can kind of see different parts of space. So it gave it yeah. more depth than just having kind of that flat black color. Um, so this is kind of 
this is an example of like, if it's all just black, it gets real flat, real fast. And so yeah. then you don't have a lot of depth there. Um, but I think when you're starting to like utilize it in, in a different way, it, it can definitely have the depth and motion. Those examples are like, they're so strong. I mean, like compositionally, and I love the variety too. Those are beautiful. Well, and like I said, I use it as like our first, our first big assignment to mm -hmm. introduce the term, just because I always sort of have trouble thinking of like, how are we going to do a review of the elements and principles, <laughs> you know, like yeah. without the kids being like, all right, I've talked about this since kindergarten. Um, right. And so we really tried to talk about that within composition and talking about like rhythm and movement and, you mm -hmm. know, bringing a lot of that in. So I think that was one thing that made a lot of their compositions more successful. Um, I have a large donated shiny surface paper. Do you think this would work with the material? Do it, I guess it would depend if it's shiny on both sides. I would test it. Um, yeah. like I said, I'm kind of like crazy art hoarder lady. So like if it's free, I'm using it <laughs> and I'll find a use for it. And that's why I tested out a bunch of papers. Like I said, we have like literally a palette of white tag board, um, that was donated. And I was like, yes, we can use this and work really big. Um, but it also like, I kept these small because I knew, well, two reasons. Um, if they had to be quarantined, it was easier to haul back and forth, or I could turn it in for mom and dad to pick up. Um, and it's not this huge intimidating piece. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was nice to keep it it's smaller for that, but also, um, it was just the, the paper that I had, but yeah, I just do a bunch of tests because sometimes I've, I've been through the, oh, I'm going to test it while I teach it. And <laughs> that's never a good moment for me, it seems. So uh, um, I've been there too. <laughs> sometimes you just gotta, you live and you learn. Mm -hmm. That's when we talk about growth mindset, right? Absolutely. Um, I'm so gonna... Andrea, what's the timeline for this project? Like how long uh, would this take or how often do you have your students per week? Yeah. Give me one second. I'm going to switch over so I can see people's faces here. Um, so I meet with my students every day, like I said, for about 45 minutes. And as we all know, teaching during this odd pandemic time, sometimes I see my kids all the time. Sometimes I'll see, I also live in kind of an area that, uh, you know, some of my students are more transient. So I might not see them um, maybe one or two times, but if I see them normally, it'd be 45 minutes um, every day all five days a week. And so um, it took probably about, I would say two weeks for the fact that we went through, we started kind of with the elements and principles. We worked our way through composition. We went through a lot of, like I said, art historical pieces and through contemporary looking at examples and having them kind of um, pick apart pieces and showing where the motion is in them. And then, um, they had to come up with uh, three different ideas and do thumbnail sketches. And then, um, and they also had to like note list what their ideas were for showing motion. Um, and then drawing it out. Um, the painting part actually is the fastest part. Cause like I said, you paint it on and like the one that I did earlier is almost dry already. Mm -hmm. um, so you can really go back, um, go back to, you know, go back to it early. And I had, like I said, I had some kids who just showed up and I'm like, man, you got to catch up. So here's a blow dryer <laughs> um, and just had them, you know, try to try to do as much as they could. Um, and then it really, the scratching it, I kind of give a, I give them a deadline and you know, if it's homework, it's homework. Um, but they have a lot of work days that they can work on it. So I would say around two weeks, I think like, I thought the size was pretty appropriate. I think they would get pretty worn out if it was yeah. any bigger. Yeah. Um, I did do it with middle school though. I did do it a lot bigger, but also our images weren't as, they weren't as detailed. Um, it was more, that one I did actually was based around um, architecture. So they, they did buildings um, and kind of like backgrounds. And we talked about foreground, middle ground background. So I think it just kind of depends what way you want to take your subject for mine. Like I said, it was a more advanced class. And so I wanted to really push them um is the motivation you're talking about in the last plan I don't know oh the motivation for um like showing motion I believe so I talk a little bit about it but if you want um like specific artists I'm very willing to share that um I put together just kind of a um 
I found all different pieces that kind of represent all different styles of art. Um, so they could really see um, kind of across the board, like what a Renaissance artist did as to opposed to like, what does Kahindi Wiley do? Um, so we really look at like, all of those different artists just to give them exposure um, to some of them. And then also so they can see like, oh, okay, what I'm looking at, there is motion in this. I didn't think there was at first, but I see that, you know, their cape is floating. So there must be some sort of wind or, you know, those types of things. Um, there was a question earlier about middle school example. I don't know if you have one handy or don't. Um, so that was when I taught middle school, high school at a, a really small school. Um, and now I'm at high school, so I don't have that example anymore. Um, but like I said, I, I let them choose. I think one year we did architecture and one we did animals um, and they had to focus on their habitat. Um, I like to do kind of like a cross like science research <laughs> type of thing a lot of times. Um, and animals seem to be a good go-to for kids. Um, and it's a lot of color. I think when, when we did architecture, it was during fall. So some kids did like spooky houses and some did castles and like yeah. they could kind of make it their own. Um, and they had a lot of fun with that. So, and with this one, I didn't give them, um, their subject just had to have motion. So I let them really run with it. Mm -hmm. It's definitely adaptable at all levels too. Cause I mean, as an elementary teacher, I've done the scratch art with the kids mm -hmm. and a student teacher who did it with my kindergartners, which was a little ambitious, um, but they were able to, you know, completely cover a surface in rainbow colors. And then we painted it with the black and they scratched out um, right. a design. So, I mean, you definitely can scaffold it for whatever level right. you have. And this is too, like, if you wanted to make your own scratch paper, this is a really affordable way to do it. Um, just because you're, you know, you can color it with whatever you want. You don't have to put a picture down first and then paint over it. That's just the method that I used because I like um, how it turns out just because it has like this interesting kind of like printmaking um, look to it. We looked at some prints too. So we looked at a lot of um, lino cut artwork so they could see like, it's okay to leave space there. It's okay to leave some marks. You know, you don't have to carve all this stuff away. So we kind of talked through that too. Um, but like you could easily like, I don't know, scratch our paper sometimes is really expensive. So, I mean, it's a really nice way to kind of, um, especially if you have donated paper, I think it's a great way. Temper paint is really cheap. Like I said, you're diluting it and you're just throwing a little bit of soap and water in there. And like this whole thing is like a cup, you know, like a cup of paint, a cup of water. Yeah. And it's lasted, I mean, I have 26 students and that thing is still like only <laughs> spray maybe a quarter gone or something. As we're kind of nearing the end, it's about 445. Does anybody have any other questions for Andrea or any other thoughts on materials or how to adapt it? We'd be happy to go through things and answer it with you. One thing too, I guess I could share is that if you have a student that might, um, these are like, might need something thicker to hold. Mm -hmm. These are the same as a pencil. So it's really easy to get like a, a holder on it too, for them oh, to use okay. it. Um, so that's, they're nice. And like the tips come off too. So I even had some students, um, they actually fit within ink, old inkwell pens. Um, mm -hmm. if you have any of those laying around, I don't know. I feel like I inherit tons the weird stuff and then I'm like oh what do we do with it um and so some of those were were better for some kids that maybe just needed a little extra for coordination um and I know I've done that with middle school too so okay any other tools that would work sharp pencils clay tools yeah I think you could use um I mean, I teach a lot of ceramics classes, so I could think of about a million <laughs> clay tools. Mm -hmm. You know, like I think I would just be careful if you're using like a needle tool or something like that because it will pick at the paper. And I, what's nice about these is like once you get the holders, like you can replace the blades, and they're not very expensive. So, um, like I think I bought what was it like a set or something like that. And then um, the tips, like I said, I put them in the, the pen holders. Um, you probably could use a paper clip. That's I what mean, I yeah. Like, I mean, I've made 
tons of weird tools for ceramics, a lot of different mm -hmm. stuff that I find. Paper clips are my go-to. Um, I know I've used like nails before. Um, like a as long, I think it it just depends like how little your kids are and how like dexterous yeah. they are. Yeah. Um, and but like I know I've made some tools before where I put like a nail in like something like when someone needs something larger that they need to hold on to, um, mm -hmm. like a dowel, or sometimes I've made stuff out of like air dry clay that fits their hand really well. Um, so those are just some things, but I mean, I think you could, as long as you try it out, I think you could use anything. The thing I like about these is that they're kind of dull. Um, so they're not going to take your paper away. So it sounds like you've done this lesson with adaptive students before. Um, what are some tips for them, like pushing firmly with the oil pastels? Like I can see that being a struggle. So that's a great question. Um, I haven't had a lot of students that uh, like, sometimes what we'll do is we'll do it in layers. Mm -hmm. And so they'll kind of work on a parts and then I'll have them work on another spot. And then it just kind of depends, I think on the student. Um, and then the other thing too, is just with, um, outlines like marker or crayon, like I said, sometimes I'll use um, the black oil pastel too. Um, I'm trying to think of what other things I've done. Um, I can't think of, <laughs> I'm like trying to think of like, mainly I think it's more like coordination and holding. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'll have like students with sensory issues and um, so they don't like the oil part of it. Yep. Um, so usually what I'll do is I'll like masking tape the part, if it doesn't have a wrapper on it or something, okay. just because they don't like that feeling. Yeah. Um, I always tell my students if they, if nothing else, like everything is about creative problem solving. And so we'll, we'll come up with a solution. So it works for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Part of me wants to explore to see if other mediums would work underneath, like if it right. would work with, like, I know you had mentioned Prismacolors, but I'm wondering about crayons, like for an elementary, like crayons are very accessible and I have right. lots. Um, yeah. And I just used oil pastels because I had a ton of them and kids were like, I want to use those. Like, what do we do with them? And after <laughs> we had done an assignment, I'm like, you're like, well, what else can we do with them? And I'm like, you can do lots of stuff. <laughs> so I just kind of, yep. that's how I, and we really started out by using kind of the, all of the container broken ones that I'll never let go of for whatever reason. <laughs> so, cause they could press as hard as they wanted with those and yep. you no, know, they were already broken. So if they needed to do some harder layers, it wasn't a big deal. So that's awesome. Yeah. I always end up breaking them. Yep, like I literally during the demo, I'm breaking them and they're like, <gasps> Like, it's fine. As long as I didn't do it on purpose, it's okay. It still works. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions for us. This is a really exciting lesson. Like, and I just, it's so neat to see high school examples because, you know, I'm just, we're at totally different levels here. And so it was, your students' work is beautiful. Thank you. I, yeah. They're, they're troopers. <laughs> yeah. I love, love, love it. And I kind of want to go home and play with this now. So <laughs> thank you so much, everybody, for joining us on your Monday. Um, let us know if you end up using this. Like, feel free to tag NASCO on social media or reach out to us if you have questions. But thank you so much. And thank you to NASCO and to Andrea. Oh, yeah, they were talented, weren't they? Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you.